The last presentation for track two, VO Sorry. We will now proceed with our next presentation, Void Free King, Syphilis Unveiled. Before we proceed, let me first introduce our speaker for this talk. His handle is DeGrug, and he goes by that handle. Grug is a domain expert consultant on VoIP security, digital forensic analysis, and reverse engineering. The Grug has spent seven years working with all aspects of information security, from penetration testing to solutions and product development. The Grug's career has seen him working for financial security consulting companies, startups, and most recently, founding his own information security company. The Grug's information security expertise ranges from penetration testing and source code auditing through to rootkit technologies and advanced digital forensic analysis and investigation. Since 2001, the Grug has been involved in active voice over IP security research, recently completing successful audits for major European and Asian telcos. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the Grug. introduction to cross-site scripting attacks for people who do not know what cross-site scripting attacks are. Okay, so our danger is pretty straightforward. Ooh. An introduction to browsers, JavaScript, we're going to look at Java, the Indonesian spice trade, Dutch East India Company, scripts, movies, plays, and others. And then a brief look at browser attack visualizations, but unfortunately, this is the text only version. Okay, so now the real one. Okay, on the VoIP freaking, this is the agenda that we've got lined up. Uh, basically, we're going to have an introduction to VoIP and me, a quick abstract on VoIP. This is basically an overview of what VoIP is, the protocols involved, in theory, how it works. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at freaking, which is the historical uh, sort of hacking prior to the internet, where people would break into phone systems and so on. Then we're going to look at VoIP freaking in particular, and then uh, VoIP phishing, which is another sort of uh, attack that will be coming out, will be, uh, be more prevalent in the years to come. And then uh, we'll have a conclusion and a Q&A session. So, the introduction. Uh, voice over IP is actually, uh, VoIP is voice or video over internet protocol. The theory is it's basically just uh, multimedia. Um, so VoIP is hot. I am hotter. Uh, I've had lots of years of security research experience. Uh, I've been focusing on VoIP security since forever. And I've got a snazzy haircut. Uh, VoIP, on the other hand, has Skype, which is pretty lame in comparison. <laughs> um, I think the important take-home message that you should like, if you all want to leave now and go to the other side, what you should remember is this, VoIP is a serious security threat, right? So this is because basically the deployments aren't waiting for security and there are no secure practices that people are aware of. So basically everything's getting rolled out prior to people figuring out how to do proper rollouts, if that makes any sense, right? So, Onto our VoIP abstract, where I'm going to teach everyone what VoIP actually is. So, a brief overview, a look at the functionality realms. Uh, VoIP is actually a generic term used to describe uh, several different interlocking protocol suites, some of which are actually competing. Um, then we're going to look at those competing and complementary protocol suites a little bit more in depth. Then we're going to look at the infrastructure that's involved, and then we're going to look at some pictures. Okay. I've got a laser pointer, I'm going to use it, even though I don't have anything to point at. As you can see, this is a word that says provides. Uh, so, the theory behind VoIP is it basically just provides a mechanism for people to communicate over a network. 
ever since uh, networks started getting really popular and getting rolled out, um, all of these academics realize that there's an opportunity to do something other than send emails and text messages to each other. So they were working at ways to come out with multimedia over IP. And they started in the early 90s, and it took them years and years. Like, it's been a decade now since they, they published the first draft standards, and only now is Voip really starting to sort of roll out and catch on. Um, part of the problem was that the early bandwidth just couldn't support the sort of, uh, the sort of space that these protocols take up. Right? When everyone's on dial-up, running something that takes 64K at a minimum is just not going to happen. Um, on the other hand, given Thailand's internet, running something that takes 64K is not going to happen over DSL either. So, <laughs> VoIP's popular in the first world. Um, this is the thing. Like, basically, even though uh, all of this stuff has been going on since forever, and VoIP is cool academically, and people get excited about security and all that stuff, the only thing that really matters is VoIP is a lot cheaper than uh, telco lines. Right? So cost is the major driver behind voice over IP. Everyone is desperate to save money. Even the telcos who are screaming about trying to shut voice over IP down on the ISPs, they are using VoIP for all of their backbone networks to save money as well. So yeah, anyway, lying bastards. Um, functionality realm. So like VoIP, as we know, is now simply about multimedia over IP. How does it work? Well, there's basically three separate areas that you need to get working in an interlocking way in order to get VoIP to actually work as a system. So you need to have signaling. Signaling is basically all the call management stuff. So it's where you dial someone's phone number, that person gets located, their phone starts to ring, and then you get told that they've picked up the phone. Right? Like That's actually a fairly large amount of uh, stuff that needs to happen simply for a phone call to happen, just for, just for the initial part to go down. So you've got like all the setup and location and tear down and whatever that goes on right here. Next you have like the media chunk, right? Obviously since we're talking about multimedia over IP networks, media has to show up at some point. So this is where all the content streams are sent back and forth. Uh, the interesting thing is that these content streams are only unidirectional. So even the, oh, sorry, we'll get to that in a minute. But, um, right. So media is actually a huge part a voice over IP, and there's, despite all that, there's actually only one protocol that we need to know about. Uh, the next one is PSDN integration. This is a great place for hacking. Uh, PSDN integration is basically uh, the public switch telephone network, PSTN. What happens is VoIP on an IP network is very cool, but if you can't phone anyone off the IP network, it's kind of lame. So there needs to be ways of pairing all of your VoIP phone calls with all of your real-world landline and mobile phone phone calls. And that is done by PSDN integration software and boxes, right? So this is basically your telephone to internet traversal point. And what you'll find is because this is where like the very, very expensive cool kit matches up with the wide, wide open internet, this is where you can do all the cool stuff. This is where you can hop directly onto the PSDN and do pretty much whatever you want to do, such as make free phone calls, spoof phone calls, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in here. You've got uh, location services, so you need to find a way of mapping real-world phone numbers to voice over IP phones, vice versa. Uh, you need to do media conversion, so you need to take uh, the codecs that are used on the internet and convert them to codecs that are used in the PSTN. And you need to do signaling propagation which uh, we won't be looking at, but I believe there's a uh, Frenchman. Is he here? Uh, all right. At other conferences, you can go and you can find out a huge amount about signaling propagation from the internet to the PSDN. All right. So, the protocol suites. Oh. I only figured out how to do animations on like a few of the slides. Okay, so uh, we've got signaling. Now, the signaling suites are basically broken up into two different camps. In the first camp, you've got like the internet crunchies, like these happy-go-lucky hippie freaks who came out with uh, the session initiation protocol, which is SIP. And you've got all the telco guys, which came out with the abomination that is H323. Uh, H323 is a huge, ugly binary protocol built on ASN1. Um, if anyone's heard of ASN1, it's probably only in relation to the various bugs that have been found in it throughout the years. Um, 
H63 is built for a huge amount of redundancy, proper failover, and so on. And it's been used primarily by the vendors to create lock-in. So if you buy a Cisco call manager, you can't deploy it via phones. You have to deploy Cisco phones because their H63 stacks are not interoperable. Uh, SIP, on the other hand, goes the other way. It operates with just about anything, including Netcat, uh, Python scripts. It's, it's wide open. Um, it was basically designed around HTTP and email. Um, so it should be very familiar when we get to it. All right. Uh, the media protocol, there's basically only this one, RTP. Uh, the real-time protocol is transported over UDP for speed and also for ease of spoofing attacks. Um, <laughs> basically, RTP is uh, its the only game in town, right? So it's the only thing out there that you need to know about. It's very, very simple to parse. It's very simple to create. Um, it's very old as well. Uh, and I, I don't think I've got any good slides in it. But um, there's some stuff such as the, basically the security of RTP is built on the randomness of only a few small fields. And what I found in tests is that randomness is basically generated by the C library function rand, um, which basically means you, when you plot a graph, it, it goes like this. Right? It's very, very easily predictable. Um, maybe I'll show pictures in a minute. All right, the PSTN integration stuff. Uh, there's basically only two protocols which uh, we'll be even talking about. First one is MGCP, which is the Media Gateway Control Protocol. Uh, media gateways are one of the main points, obviously, between media traversal. So they take uh, internet stuff in, internet media in on one side, and they have telephone trunks in the other, and they convert back and forth. Uh, they're a great place to attack, because if they're directly exposed on the internet, uh, MGCP as a protocol. In the RFC, it's got a section on security, which consists of the following line. Security is assumed to be implemented in another protocol. Um, with MGCP, you can basically take over trunk lines. You can drop whatever you want directly onto the PSDN. And uh, what you'll find is that MGCP boxes are widely available. Uh, mostly from universities, um, although anyone who does any attacking will tell you that just about everything is widely available from universities. Um, this is another one. I haven't talked about this one before. It's a, a new attack, uh, basically Enum. Enum is a protocol for uh, mapping our E9, uh, E164 phone numbers, which is like your normal phone number, onto voice over IP networks. The idea behind it is that if you have a VoIP-enabled phone and you're trying to phone someone else who has a VoIP-enabled phone, and both of you are using uh, real phone numbers, rather than routing through the PSTN, you will look up in the Enum database to find out if there's a voice over IP route, which will give you a cheaper cost. Um, the problem, of course, is that this means that everything that's not in the Enum database gets routed over the PSTN, and everything that is in the Enum database gets routed to the location stored in this database. And the, the databases are actually maintained by a bunch of volunteers. Uh, so there's four of them out there. They're all really, really easy to break into. They've got tons of like SQL injections and so on. Um, and none of the big players, such as the banks, have figured out that they need to be registered in Enum uh, in order for their customers to reach them via voice over IP. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, a little bit more on session initiation protocol, because I, I did say that this talk was going to be on syphilis. Um, basically, SIP is an ASCII text protocol. It's designed by Internet Crunchies. It's the bastard child of HTTP and email. Um, it's over a decade old. Like The design began in uh, 1995. Their first release was at the end of 95, beginning of 96. Um, for some reason, it's still considered an emerging protocol. So if you read any uh, press release stuff on it, you'll almost always see like the new SIP or like using new emerging voice over IP protocols. What they're talking about is this decade old is a protocol. Um, it's, it's very commonly used for uh, new deployments and it's the most prevalent protocol on the internet. So if you're doing any VoIP scanning stuff, you're probably gonna be looking for uh, SIP. 
Right, SIP messages, uh, they're basically either a request or a response message. They start out with a start line, which will have a method name and then uh, the target URI. There's a bunch of header files, uh, sorry, a bunch of headers which follow. Uh, they contain information about the message, such as the destination, the origin, and the route. And then there's a body, which is usually a uh, description of how the media stream is supposed to be located. Uh, that'll use SDP, which we won't be talking about. <coughs> okay. So, start line. Uh, as I said, you basically have either a request or a response. Um, this stuff should look fairly familiar to anyone who's done anything with HTTP. So the method-based request system, you basically send an invite, a buy, a register, or whatever, and that uh, indicates what you want the message to do. So an invite creates a phone call, a buy would tear down a phone call, a register would uh, register your location with a registrar. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, so register is used basically to inform uh, other VoIP entities where you are, your specific IP address. Uh, response messages. It's generally an error code or a status code of some sort, plus a reason. And you'll see that this smells like HTTP. So you'll get things like 404 not found and 403 forbidden. Uh, headers. Uh, the important ones are basically the ones that are used for display information. So you've got a to URI, which basically says this message is supposed to go to someone. Um, it should show up, but it, it's actually not used in the uh, in the start line, the method is followed by a URI, and that URI is what's actually used, not this one here, the to URI. Um, the from is the, uh, the URI that you want to have displayed as the originator of the phone call. Uh, now, this is, this is for display, right? So what you'll find is that even though these are only really intended for display, a lot of broken, uh, and by broken I mean very commonly deployed telco kit, will use the to and the from for billing purposes. So you can bill to other people simply by uh, editing this content. You can also uh, avoid getting billed. You can also do spoofing. There's a large number of attacks you can do simply because the people who implement the software look at to and from and think that that actually means the to and the from. Uh, what they're really looking for is this information here, the contacts, the contacts header. The contact header is used to say, this is the specific location that you should be talking to. Uh, the contact header is the critical one, right? So if you're, if you're going to be uh, tested for authorization or authentication, it should be against this contact URI, not the from URI. But uh, it's very infrequently that you'll find that. Uh, the max forwards, very simple time to live stuff. Uh, you can use it for trace route. And there's also uh, very bad ideas that have been implemented, such as the alert info. So the alert info header basically supplies a URL for a file to be downloaded and played rather than a ringing sound on the remote system. So when you phone someone up, you can say, rather than playing like oldphone.wave, download and play nigeriangreeting.wave. And then you'll get someone saying, you know, Dear sir or madam, I come to you in friendship. Um, all right, the, the core infrastructure in voice over IP uh, is the sort of generalized stuff. You basically have uh, user agents or terminals. Um, this is basically the soft phones or hard phones or voicemail systems or whatever. These are the things that actually place and receive phone calls. Okay, so these are just endpoints. Um, depending on what protocol you're talking about, you end up using different terms. But uh, soft phone and hard phone is usually pretty, pretty much covers everything. Uh, then you'll have proxies. Proxies are used to create a sort of a fixed entry and exit point to a voice over IP system. They're used to make sure that the internals of the system, of the, the voice over IP network, are not exposed directly on the internet. Um, Conversely, they can also be used as great ways of doing, uh, for instance, port scans behind. Um, so a lot of proxies are actually very poorly configured and very poorly developed. And by sending them uh, misformed SIP packets, you can tell them to attempt to connect to a large number of internal addresses on a large number of ports. And they will return uh, error or success messages back to you. 
and you can use that to do port scanning to them. And they're, they're also frequently set up so that they bypass firewalls. So uh, they're great entry points into systems as well. Uh, there's also location servers. Location servers have different names. Uh, in SIP, they're called registrars. And in H323, they're called gatekeepers. Uh, essentially, the idea is that these things map an IP address, so your, your IP network address, to something that someone is going to try and call. So your URI, your, your universal resource uh, indicator, something like that. Um, so if you have a bob at biloxi.com, it will go and it will track down where Bob has logged into and send a message to there. Right? So these things are great to target, um, particularly because they have a large amount of information and they play a very critical role in the actual working of voice over IP. Uh, and then finally, there's gateway boxes. Um, there's both media and signaling gateways, and their role is simply to uh, bridge two networks. So. Typically, that's going to be between the PSTN network and the IP network. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, these things are very good things to target if you're trying to get into the PSTN and, for instance, commit toll fraud and get free phone calls. All right? So that was a, a sprawling introduction to voice over IP. I'm going to look briefly at uh, freaking. So we'll look a little bit at the history of freaking, the techniques, and then the death of freaking. So historically, uh, freaking started in the 60s. Uh, it used to exploit inbound signaling, uh, relied very heavily on hardware-based attacks. Um, and you'll see here's uh, two famous freaks. So Steve, Steve, and that might be Steve as well. Um, <laughs> uh, there's also Captain Crunch, who I mentioned because he was here two years ago. And he'll never be here again. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, like basically, all of this freaking stuff was loads of fun, and they, everyone was being happy and hippie and free love, and let's you know screw the phone systems or whatever. And then they found out that the phone system <coughs> guys made a lot of money, and they didn't like that too much. Um, the techniques that they used basically exploited uh, one major se uh, security fuck up. There was inbound signaling. So, basically. All of the commands that you would send over a phone were sent over the same line as all of your voice data, which meant that it was sent as basically audio tones. So freakers who had equipment to generate those audio tones could send commands. Um, so like the classic one is 2600, which was used for blue boxing. Uh, all of this stuff was typically used for toll fraud, which is basically uh, making phone calls without paying for them. Now, thanks to voice over IP, toll forward like that is less interesting because everyone can make free phone calls anyway. Um, ooh. Oh my god. That's terrible. Cool. Okay, so on the next slide, as you can see, um, <laughs> uh, this one's all pornography, so if we could just advance to the next one. <laughs> Okay, and now a short interpretive dance. Um, okay, so this very blurry object over here <laughs> is basically a, a very old school blue box. Uh, the one I had in high school didn't look like that. Okay, while I do that, let me tell you the one story I have about old school freaking. So when I was in high school, um, I had someone make me a red box. A uh, red box basically played, like, we, we had these really old pay phones, right? And when you put in a quarter, like when you put money in, it would generate a series of tones that indicated that you put in 25 cents. So uh, someone built a red box for me which generated the same tones. So you could go up to these pay phones and you could hold the thing up to the mouthpiece and you just hit the button and like register that you're putting money in. So I decided to go and use this thing. I, I wander out and I, I find a box that's you know, it's old enough that I can actually exploit it. And I rock up. I make my long distance phone call to my friend. I put in like five bucks at the beginning. I'm really cool. And about halfway through the conversation, an operator breaks in and says, Sir, you're going to have to put in more money. So, you know, being a smart freaker, I hold my box up and I start hitting the button. And I hear, Sir, sir, sir. I go, Yeah, what is it? She goes, Sir, you have to put in real money. <laughs> So 
So uh, red box just kind of died out. Um, <laughs> so now, unfortunately, we've had the death of freaking. Uh, basically, that came about because they now have out-of-band signaling. So all of the signaling stuff happens external to the voice data. So all of your audio content is separate from all of the stuff that says, I am calling from this phone number, I'm trying to reach this other phone number, and so on. Uh, also, there was this, the very aggressive prosecution of freakers. They basically, they, they tried to do cutting off the head attacks. They took all the people that knew what the fuck they were doing and threw them in jail. And so those of us that showed up didn't have anyone to learn from. Like when the operator gets online, stop using your fucking red box. Um, so they've also had improved uh, fraud analysis techniques, or far more improved than Mac OS anyway. Um, <laughs> So the improved forward analysis stuff basically means that they now uh, automatically detect when people have uh, made a large number of long distance phone calls and they still have no uh, bill showing up. They have, they've got stuff like that just to make sure that like, even if they can't attack, if they can't detect the technical uh, attack that you're doing, they'll notice it when you're ripping them off because that's actually all they care about. You can do all the technical shit you want as long as you pay them the money. Um, now, of course, we have the, I'm not dead yet, I'm feeling better. So VoIP freaking is allowing all of these guys who stopped breaking stuff because they didn't want to go to jail and they couldn't do it anymore, they now have a chance to get back in the game. And it's also uh, given an opportunity for a whole bunch of other people to get into the freaking game, which is all very exciting. So we're going to look at VoIP freaking briefly. So we're going to look at uh, some of the motivations, uh, an overview of attacks, and some of the techniques. Now. Fair warning, the agenda might not in any way actually mirror the content of the slides. Um, okay, so uh, we've got hackers who basically enjoy exploring new technology. Uh, that's what they say. What they actually mean is they want to get rid of finding a bug. Right? Um, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do, but given the, the cost of technology and so on these days, you can do most of it in your room with an old Linux box. So going out and exploring the PSTN doesn't make a huge amount of sense unless you're trying to get rich in the process. Um, there's also a bunch of guys who are now returning to the PSTN after they got kicked out in the 90s. So they weren't allowed to go and do all of these attacks, and they had to move on to the internet and do like fucking web hacking and so on, which they found very boring. <laughs> and now they've got a chance to get back in and start screwing the telcos again. And of course, we've got a large number of people who are now just trying to make a buck. Um, this is one of the things we're going to focus on a little bit more towards the end of the presentation when we start looking at phishing attacks and how voice over IP makes phishing attacks far more dangerous. Okay, so here is a, a overview of a large number of different attacks. Um, so we've got media attacks. So as we were talking about in the functionality realm, you've got all of the media content that's getting passed between uh, two endpoints. There's any number of attacks you can do on that. Obviously, the two interesting ones are eavesdropping, which is where you can copy the media content, you can monitor the media content and see what's going on, so you can listen to other people's phone calls. And there's injection, where you can actually add content to the media stuff that's going through. So you can take a media stream and replace portions of it with your own content. Uh, we'll be talking about that in the context of phishing, but it could be interesting in, say, contract negotiations, if you know that it's you versus someone else going for a contract, you could inject uh, what you'd want him to say to the HR people, um, which might make his phone call interview go very poorly. Um, signaling attacks, there's basically, uh, there's a lot more than I've listed up here, but uh, there's hijacking attacks, which we'll look at a bit more in depth. Uh, hijacking is basically taking over someone else's phone number. So, um, Thanks to voice over IP, you can no longer assume that when you dial someone's phone number, you will actually get that person, um, which is great. So hijacking is going to be cool stuff. Rerouting is basically where you, you can reroute phone calls or reroute uh, the signaling path to include, say, a third party. Um, there's also, obviously, eavesdropping attacks that you can do at this layer, so you can force yourself to be added to conversations and so on. Uh, PSTN attacks. Um, you can also do hijacking at the PSTN layer. I've ignored denial of service because I have to admit that I find denial of service stuff very, very boring. 
obviously you can DOS any of these layers, but why would you want to? Um, like stopping Aunt Millie from talking to her nephew is very uninteresting. <laughs> Phoning Aunt Millie and telling her that I'm her bank and I need her PIN number, that is interesting, right? Um, okay, and uh, media gateways. So MG is the abbreviation for media gateway, uh, not just for the cars. Um, and we're going to be talking very briefly about uh, intrusion attacks. So basically, taking over a media gateway and forcing it to do what you want to do. All right, next slide. Zupa. Okay, so all of that stuff in the context of trying to make money. Because um, we're all trying to do that, but some of us are Ukrainian and we can do it a lot better than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so the application of VoIP freaking for the purposes of phishing. Okay, so phishing is basically harvesting personal information such as account numbers and access codes as well as uh, personal identification information. Obviously, you're doing all of this for the purposes of fraud. Like, we're doing this because we want to take someone else's account and empty all the money. Um, there's a large number of exploitation scenarios. And we're going to be seeing these. Right. So, as it says, ex expect to see these in the news next year or not. The reason there's an or not there is because there's actually no way of detecting if these attacks have taken place. In fact, we don't even know if these attacks are taking place right now, and I wouldn't be surprised if they are. Um, so, anyway, this is going to be a major new source of money for uh, the Ukrainian underground and the Romanians. Um, the techniques, very briefly. So, for instance, we can impersonate a bank. So caller ID spoofing is very, very easy to do, is very easy to do because as I mentioned before, when we're using SIP, the from header is used to um, basically show who the caller ID, uh, what the caller ID should display, whereas the contact header is actually used for where the call should route to. So what we can do is we can say I am phoning from Suncorp when in fact we are phoning from uh, a small Russian village without any problem. So caller ID spoofing, which used to be quite complicated and used to be sort of like the cool thing that you know, all these freaks would do in their like hardcore, like lots of boxing and like generating tones and so on. These days you can do it with like a, a Linux box and a text editor. Um, uh, it's not very exciting uh, anymore technically, only in, uh, in being able to use it to a further end, such as getting rich. Um, hijacking attacks. So this is actually an O-Day that I'm going to be releasing. Um, you can do enum poisoning. So enum, as I mentioned before, was the way of mapping uh, your real phone number onto a VoIP network. And it allows uh, very, very cheap cost routing to go through by using only VoIP pathways rather than running through the PSTN. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the enum is administered in uh, four separate databases which are used by all of the major SIP brokers and all of the major SIP peering points. Um, they're also administered by a bunch of volunteers. And on one of the main ones, they haven't even bought a new SSL certificate in over a year. So their SSL certificate has expired, and when you try and log in, it pops up that huge, you know, like, are you really sure you want to talk to these people? They're too cheap to buy a $100 certificate. Um, and these guys are now in charge of making sure that when someone puts in the customer service number for their bank, and they happen to be using voice over IP phone, these guys are now in charge of making sure that that actually goes to the real bank's location rather than to a evil call server somewhere on the internet which will answer the phone, run out something such as, you know, welcome to financial institution, please enter account information, be thanking you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, even poisoning attacks, um, very cool. No one's doing them yet, as far as we know. Um, anyway, watch out for them. Account theft. This stuff's pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, you just break into someone's account, and you can use it. So, theoretically, we could break into uh, Lloyd's TSP's account, and we could make free phone calls on their dime. Or, if we're evil, we can redirect all of their inbound phone calls to our location. And once again, we could answer the phone we can play a message, record the data, and then silently redirect them to the original destination. 
and uh, man in the middle attacks. So man in the middle attacks are basically if we exist anywhere along the voice over IP route between the customer and the target institution or the target call center, we can do manipulation. So we can add content to remove content from their media stream. We can monitor the media stream. And uh, we can add ourselves. And uh, we can basically do an attack such as like someone phones up and says, I would like to do a transfer. And we pass that through. And they say, which, like, which account would you like to transfer it to? I say, you know, my Art Millie's attack uh, account. We can replace that with my Ukrainian bank account. And you know, we can just proxy the information back and forth. Uh, they're already doing that on the web. This will allow them to do it for all of the call centers as well. And there's far more people using call centers than there are using uh, websites. Sorry, for banking. So, a new question. All right. So I talked for a very long time about something I had a slide for. I'm an idiot. Um, so, let's see, blah, 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 blah. Assume that I didn't mention this earlier, I just noticed this one. We can, assume, we can insert a, a false entry for a financial institution, and anyone that phones that up will get redirected to us, yada, 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 Ukrainians. Um, okay, <laughs> account theft. So, uh, <laughs> there's no Ukrainians in the audience, is there? Is that even scary? Turkey. <laughs> Okay, we've got half Ukrainian. So, if everyone would just do a replacement for when I said Ukrainian, Romanian. <laughs> <laughs> You're not half Romanian. <laughs> okay, so um, account theft. Like basically, at the carrier grade SIP registrar, we can hijack and we can break things. So even theoretically, if the financial institution that we're targeting does not have voice over IP exposed to the internet. As long as their carrier does, or the carrier that their customer is using does, or one of the carriers that is acting as an intermediary between the customer and the financial institution is using VoIP, we can hack shit up, uh, which is technical for uh, we can replace the entries in their SIP registrars with our own entries. Um, we can also do stuff like redirect inbound calls. So if we can take over the registrar, we can basically do anything with their phone number which is all very cool stuff. Um, man in the middle, we can do uh, manipulations for where the media stream should go. So even if all of the signaling stuff is left alone, we can change simply the locations of the media streams so that we can point the media to ourselves, to our own evil servers, and let all the call handling go through someone else. Um, so we can do, uh, one of the cool ones we can do is with uh, signaling manipulation, we can create uh, basically false conference calls. So every time someone makes a phone call, we can say, we're also part of that phone call conversation. And we can have ourselves injected as a third party, which is going to be silent to either end, because you're not going to go like, now we're joining the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, basically, the, the false conference call stuff you can actually do, you don't have to do it just at the call setup time. You can also send a re-invite. So once the call has started taking place, you can inject new signaling data that says the existing conversation is now being upgraded to a conference call. Please send a copy of all of the data to my evil call server. Um, and the important thing is that all of these attacks don't simply need to happen at the financial institution or at the customer end. They can happen anywhere in between. So simply based on the fact that there's been a huge rollout of voice over IP very rapidly, particularly by a lot of the telcos for their backbone networks. These attacks are fairly easy to do and are probably already commonplace without us knowing about it, simply because it's, it's so difficult for us to uh, tell what's going on. Okay, and there's also media stream manipulation. So with media stream, we can, al we can alter the content of what's getting sent back and forth. So the cool thing is, rather than eavesdropping and like just monitoring what people say, we can make sure that they say the right things. So we can inject content into an existing call. Now, uh, the technique, which I think would be really cool for this, would be to break into a Bangalore call center 
and to make sure that whenever anyone's put on hold after they've gone through the initial call tree and they've got that whole, you know, your call is important to us, please stay on the line, you can place in the queue. Hello. <laughs> please enter account information and PIN number after the deal. <laughs> If that's done in a slick manner, it's very, very likely that a large number of people are going to get caught out. More importantly, it's very, very unlikely that the guys doing it will get caught. And the reason for that is there is absolutely nothing that detects these attacks these days. Now, I've very cleverly been told that I'm supposed to run a little bit under, and so I time things perfectly at being way under. I want up there. So, um, the new and improved internet telephony, it now makes phone calls as secure as email. <laughs> the, important, the important thing that you guys are going to have to remember in the future is that when you dial someone, it doesn't mean that you're actually going to get them. You might get anyone else. Even worse is after you do ensure that you've, you've gotten through to the person you're trying to reach, you can't be sure that halfway through the conversation they're not replaced by someone else. All right? So, all right, what you hear in a phone call might be more than that, what was said. Okay, um, the exciting demo that I had set up to run actually doesn't run. So, <laughs> uh, we will now spend the next half hour discussing questions. <laughs> Are there any questions? Are there any answers? All right, yep. Mm -hmm. They have to be like, like, like able to like sniff the communication between two parties in, able, in order to like be able to hijack it or uh, no, you don't. And the the cool reason is like uh, for hijacking. All right, just like I have to show you this picture. It's fucking awesome. Bear with me. I had it here somewhere. All right. I don't know how to make a map work, um, so I drag things across. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the critical things with uh, RTP is ensuring that you have truly random values. Uh, the reason you need truly random values is to prevent someone from doing a blind spoofing attack. This is where they can guess the values, they can predict what the values will be, and then they can generate them locally and send them out. So as we can see, what we have here is a truly random graph of uh, <laughs> time versus value. <laughs> um, this, was, this was done, uh, oh, right. ignore the vendor name on the slide. <laughs> No one here from a major vendor, is there? Okay, good. So I'm not breaking any non-disclosure agreements because they don't know about it. Um, <laughs> basically, like for for an RTP attack, uh, for an RTP injection attack, this is where like we're just adding content. We can either monitor what's going across the wire, copy all of that data, produce our own versions, and re-inject it. Or we can guess what the data would be and then just inject it anyway. And this shows that on one of the major uh, VoIP vendors out there, guessing and injecting is um, trivial, shall we say. So <laughs> basically, the, the important take home message is VoIP is not secure unless your vendors are not dumbasses. <laughs> OK, but anyway. A lot of the VoIP attacks don't actually require you to monitor things. The monitoring makes it easier, but these guys make it even easier on their own. So, <laughs> any other questions? Have you mentioned zero day? I did mention zero day. Uh, I did that to see if there's anyone awake in the audience. <laughs> now, um, basically, the the O day attack is all right. Here we go. We'll drop one out because I'm a nice guy. Um, Basically, there's a product called SER, which is the SIP Express router. It's used very heavily on the internet as a proxy between um, internal SIP networks and the external uh, internet SIP network. Um, proxies are frequently also used to do authentication. So if you try and make a phone call, 
you will authenticate to your proxy. Your proxy will say, you're allowed to make this long distance phone call billed to this person's account, and then send it through. So uh, proxies are very good things to attack. Uh, proxies, because they do authentication, would be great places to have some way of bypassing the, the critical uh, crypto stuff that they do, because like, it's all MD5 hashes, which take too much time to brute force remotely and so on. But what would be super cool is if there was like um, a way whereby you had a five minute window that anything that you captured could be replayed. And what we find is, all right, you have to bear with me one minute while I track out the, uh, the manual that they have. So this is a discussion of the auth module in uh, SER. Um, just to talk very briefly about how the authentication works. Basically what happens is it shoots you out a, like you have to authenticate message. And all right, that you have to authenticate message will have this thing, a nonce. And the nonce is to prevent replay attacks. So when you have to authenticate, you have to include the nonce in your MD5 hash, right? So this prevents people from doing something whereby you take in, uh, you capture someone's data, and then they say you have to authenticate, and you just take the data that you captured, and you send it back and say, sure, you know, here you go, I authenticate, and it lets you through. Now, critically, a nonce actually has to expire after it's been used. Otherwise, all you do is you create a smaller window for a replay attack. So right here, the default is 300 seconds, which is five minutes. Um, now, the bug is that they don't expire the nonce if there is a successful authentication. All right. So what that means is if it says you have to authenticate, and the real user sends their authentication credentials along with this nonce information, you can copy that, and you now have a five minute window to reuse that information. What's even better is that all of the phones out there will do background authentications to make sure that when the user wants to make a phone call, they're pre-authenticated. So you can, you can basically be guaranteed that if anyone's using SER and you can sniff, you can use SER as them. So you can route all of your calls through them anyway. Is the not inside the It is, but the problem here is one spike so once the nonce gets passed out and the user takes the nonce, they generate the MD5 the five hash and they return it. The server does the same thing, it generates the MD5 hash, it does a compare and says, okay, you generated the correct MD5 hash, therefore you've used your nonce and your password and all that, you're good to go. What it should do at that point is discard that nonce and generate a new one so that the next time you try and authenticate, you don't get the old nonce back. You should get a new nonce. The problem is that it sends the old nonce all right, so there's a, a window of opportunity to sniff and reuse the same nonce. So this whole thing about how it's supposed to protect against replay attacks basically means it will protect against replay attacks that happen at intervals of greater than five minutes. Any other questions? No? We've got eight minutes. All right. You mentioned that, um, that with the EMU database, you think that people should be putting their details in there to stop someone else from putting more details in there. Mm -hmm. Do you reckon since these, since these new servers and that are so um, shitty at the moment, mm -hmm. would it be better to not put it in and to <coughs> hope it doesn't happen than put it in and to have a new player? Like, I know security is not um, security, um, security at all, but I'm just thinking. I, I think that's a toss up um, of which way you want to go. Now there's four databases, and there'll be attacks such as I'm not. Sh I don't actually know if the databases are verified against each other. So it might be possible that if you can attack one database, but not the others, um, they will do a check at some point and say this database has got different information than the rest of us. Therefore, like we better figure out what the fuck's going on. Or if they'll go, well, he's got his information, we've got ours, you know. So be it. Um, I don't know how all that stuff is done internally because they're, they're not very public about it. The thing is that 
my understanding is that they're basically like they're, they're four different competing groups, right? So they're, they're all volunteers and stuff like that, but they're basically like, we're volunteers, but we want you to use our service rather than those guys' service because they're smelly, horrible, hippie people and they don't know about how to really do it. So, I mean, it, it really is up to you. Like one of the things that might, that might be an issue is if they don't actually verify against each other, it depends on what order they get called. So if three of them are secure and one isn't secure, but the insecure one comes first in the list, then you know, an attacker doesn't need to worry about the three secure guys, he just needs to go after that one. And from my understanding is that um, the order in which they're, they're tested is basically implementation dependent. So it's up to whoever is peering with them to say like which databases we query first and whatever. But like Enum, it's a great idea in theory and it's a really horrible idea in practice. Like, Frequently the case. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, you can both ask your questions, and I'll, I'll choose which one is more intelligent and answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, suppose someone wants to learn more uh, more about that SIP and uh, in practical terms, are there any tools or any software, any any course of action um, to go for this? That you recommend? You know what? <laughs> we had another question on the other side. <laughs> Um, you know, that would be a perfect plant if I could go like, funny that you should mention that because as it happens, I do offer a voice over IP attacking course that lasts for two days in which I go over a variety of tools and attack scenarios. But since that just ran, you're like a little bit late. Um, basically, my recommendation is that uh, I'll be releasing a couple of tools uh, at this com. Like after this, I'm going to release my uh, RTP injection tool um, called Syringe. That's a reasonably good tool to start out with. It is very early days of voice over IP, so basically the information that you'll be getting is like proper protocol information, and you'll just have to guess how the attacks work in your own, you'll have to generate them yourself. Or you could wait until the book that I'm writing comes out next year, or you could uh, go to one of my very expensive courses at any number of conferences. Um, that's about it, I'm afraid. Like, there's, there's no good sites. Like Everything out there is pretty much rubbish, because the people who do it are like, voice over IP security is exciting and hot. We better get something together. And they'll roll out, like, make sure you have a firewall. And that'll be like their, their voice over IP security recommendations. You know? Then they'll have links to like a couple of RFCs, and they're, they're pretty happy with themselves. So there's not a lot of information out there. Good luck. Have you seen uh, any evolution from the vendors regarding accepting SIP and RTP over TLS? Um, basically, RTP over TLS doesn't work because, yeah, um, you you really you just you don't have the, the the speed, right? So when you've got like when you've got a real time communication issue, like when you're trying to do a phone call, you have to make sure that there is a minimum amount of time spent doing things like encryption, passing packets around, encoding and decoding codecs. As soon as you spend too much time doing that, you get laggy, chopped up phone calls with very, very poor quality. So the QoS, the latency, the quality of service, these are all absolutely critical, and most of them, most of these things impact very, very directly on security. So uh, you'll find that like um, in the US, for example, in order to have uh, acceptable levels of telephone conversation, there's up to 150 milliseconds of lag that's allowed for an, a, a continental call. So it's from one coast to the other coast. The longest amount of time it could take for the voice packet, or just the voice content, is 150 milliseconds. You'll find that the ping times, like just for a packet to go from one end to the other, is 100 milliseconds. Your voice sample rate is every 20 milliseconds. So you've now spent 120 milliseconds out of your possible 150 doing nothing but capturing and sending the data. Now to encode, put it into a packet, encrypt it, send it across a map, send it through a firewall, decrypt it, decode it, unpack it, and then play it back, you have 30 milliseconds. And you don't want to spend that 30 milliseconds having your like 32 megahertz phone trying to run SSL. <laughs> like it's not going to happen. Um, the real, like, the, there are ways of doing secure RTP. Uh, there, there's uh, SRTP protocol and there's also ZRTP. The problem is that there's 
while there's a standard to do the encryption, there's not a standard to do the key exchange. So the vendors have come up with their own sort of like in-house solutions. And by and large, they're basically absolute rubbish. And um, the way that it, it ends up going is that your Cisco kit can probably encrypt to other Cisco kit if it's all of like the latest and greatest firmware release or the last stable release or something like that. But as soon as you drop in an open source box or a box from another vendor or anything like that, it's all going to uh, turn to shit. What nice go. It basically, it's just going to collapse. So encryption, in theory, it's a great idea. And in practice, it's a very bad idea. It just it doesn't work in voice over IP. OK. <laughs> There's nuances to that, but yeah. Additional questions? We probably have time for one last question. Rob? Yeah, they can both see who shouts louder. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you paint a pretty bleak outlook, um, but you haven't mentioned what, I mean, in the next years, what do you see happening in terms of um, a better detection, and what do you see happening in terms of better security that might not be encryption? Um, better security probably will happen, but since it has to happen everywhere in order for the entire thing to actually be secured, like it's not going to be good enough if a few places have good security if all the telcos have bad security, right? That doesn't solve anything. It's like the internet. It's like you can have very good firewalls in place, but as long as there's still people who click on things that get emailed to them, you're still, you're still in trouble. Um, in terms of detection, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be more stuff coming out. Detection for a lot of these attacks is fairly simple, but it's, it's again the same sort of thing in that you can only detect the attack in, a, in the place where it specifically takes place rather than like across the entire stream. So you have to have detection in place across the entire path, the path of each of the organizations that handles that content which, you know, uh, that's fairly unlikely given the fact that, like, Thailand has got 700 people applying for voice over IP operator licenses, and Malaysia's got, like, close to 100 existing voice over IP carriers. And this is, like, last year. So it's probably greater than that by now. And these are just, like, two small Asian countries. Like, the U.S. has chock-a-block with places that are, you know, fly-by-night, plugged into the PSTN. They run an asterisk box, plugged into, like, someone's DSL network and you can do whatever you like with them. So, I don't know, I, obviously things will improve because they have to and there's a lot of money getting thrown at the problem, but I don't... So, so do, you, I mean, do you see an evolution of the existing stuff to some kind of security, or do you see us just giving up? Nothing's changed in a year, so if there, there has been any evolution, it's still to come. Like, from when I started doing this voice over IP stuff to now, like in two years, all that's changed is I've written more tools. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, something's bound to happen eventually when like people freak out enough. But between now and then, like, who knows? All right, there's one last question. You've got uh, negative three seconds. So. Same question, so. yeah, oh, it's all right. right. You have the same question. So two with one stone. I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are, Rock. And thank you very much for your presentation today.